May 1940. The world watches hopelessly as Nazi invaders mount a blitzkrieg attack against France and march triumphantly through the streets of Paris. But behind the tears of a defeated people comes the rumbling of rebellion. Enraged French citizens answer General de Gaulle's command and fight for freedom with an underground organization committed to sabotage and other acts of defiance. This resistance grew bit by bit, comprised of both men and women, regardless of political, moral or religious persuasion. I became a founder of the Parisian Liberation Committee and the organization that directed the resistance and the national insurrection. Hitler himself visited France during the occupation. He marveled at the great monuments. He reveled in his conquest. Even the Eiffel Tower, 51 years old and over a thousand feet tall, became a hostage as Germans exploited its great height, using the tower as an antenna to send coded radio signals to their armies. Ironically, the silhouette of the tower against the Paris skyline offered hope to the free French underground. It was a symbol of liberty, a symbol of France. Under the occupation, the idea predominated among all the French to know that one day one would be free to climb up the Eiffel Tower. When Allied troops finally liberated Paris, this handful of free Frenchmen celebrated by climbing the Eiffel Tower and unfurling the French tricolor flag. Down below, citizens spat and cursed at the fleeing Germans. But from the pinnacle of the tower, liberty, equality, and fraternity reclaimed its mantle of glory. For most of the world, the Eiffel Tower is France. It is light and hope, poetry and magic. Her complex geometry holds the dreams of lovers. The French may enjoy the distinct honor of having created and nurtured this international monument, but her home is in the hearts of free people everywhere. Tonight on Modern Marvels, La Tour Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower. There is something about great height that suggests a spirit of triumph to the soul. It forces people's vision to heaven, while it offers a calming perspective to the chaos of the world below. Throughout the ages, people have challenged architectural and engineering limits to achieve great structural height. Sometimes to spy on enemies approaching from a distance and at other times in an attempt to get closer to God. There are those who insist on finding practical applications for towers. They make good broadcast antennas, or they're a fine place for a revolving restaurant. But the real appeal of towers comes from a purer notion. Towers are a celebration of will. They speak to our ambitions, they are the joyous declaration that we exist. The world's best loved tower is the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Its soaring height, its delicate lines, its airy volume, all reflect the best part of the French spirit. Designed and built in 1889, it was the centerpiece in a celebration of the bloody French Revolution 100 years earlier. On July 14, 1789, in a flood of revolutionary passion, Parisian artisans led an attack against French aristocracy and stormed the Bastille, 
the infamous prison where the poor and politically incorrect were locked away. The insurrection spread across France and patriots rallied to the battle cry of freedom, the Marseillaise. Let us go, children of the fatherland. Our day of glory has arrived. Against us stands tyranny, the bloody flag is raised. Come together in the countryside to lower these savage soldiers. They come right into our arms to cut the throats of your sons, your country. To arms, citizens, form your battalions, let us march, that their impure blood should water our fields. This nationalistic eruption reverberated across Europe and set the stage for modern democratic movements. And the French people were justifiably proud of the positive contributions their revolution had made. But a century later, the French ego was bruised after a devastating military defeat to Germany. The idea of mounting a spectacular international exposition seemed like a grand way to remember past glory and forget about contemporary setbacks. They were still um, sad because there was, there was in 1870 a terrible war with Germany and we had lost uh, two provinces, Alsace and Lorraine. And so, so that the French people were very pleased to have this exhibition to show they, they were very great and uh, you see. Um, the country was quite rich. It was decided there needed to be a centerpiece for the celebration, an artistic statement which would loom over the crowds. The bravado of the industrial age suggested an engineering accomplishment, a tower. The tower was important uh, as uh, something very clever in technology, you see. And nobody in the world was able to build a tower of uh, a thousand feet, you see. Uh, lots of people tried in America. Uh, there were lots of plans of towers, but they never built them. A competition was held for design. Architects from all over France submitted elaborate plans. The first one was um, done by a man called Maurice Coquelin. He was one of the first engineers in Gustave Eiffel's uh, staff. Gustave Eiffel was France's premier architect engineer. His reputation sprang from his visionary work on bridges. He explored the revolutionary concept of metal frame construction. His genius attracted the finest architects in France to his studio, and Eiffel's association with the project virtually guaranteed its funding and completion. Two young engineers on Eiffel's staff Maurice Coquelin and Emile Nogier actually created the concept of the 300-meter tower for the 1890 exhibition in Paris. They sketched the first crude designs for a framed structure, then called on architect Stephen Savastra to add ornamental flourishes, the arching floral elements and sculptural nuances. Their romantic inspiration was an 1887 French architectural notion that one could touch the sky from a structure if it reached the impossible height of 1,000 feet. Eiffel saw their plans and shared their dream. Their work was soon adopted by Monsieur Eiffel. At first, he agreed to add his name to the contest submission to improve its chances of winning. But he quickly became interested in the tower concept and began to add his own unique flourishes. Once Eiffel's name was on the project, everyone knew the outcome of the competition. With his social and political connections, Eiffel was well equipped to push the project through the Parisian bureaucracy. And he had the technical ability to transform the project from a paper design to a three-dimensional reality. The tower was designed to represent France's participation in the industrial age. As a symbol and as an engineering challenge, there was a lot riding on the success of the tower. But Eiffel was determined to exhibit the same innovative spirit in construction that he had employed in the design.
It is air and light, form and motion, as sturdy as man's resolve and as ethereal as his thoughts. The Eiffel Tower is as much an idea of structure as it is an extraordinary physical monument. And the process of its construction reflects both the concept of prefabrication from the industrial age and the advanced building theories of the dawning 20th century. February 28, 1887. Gustav Eiffel gathered a crowd of dignitaries to witness the commencement of construction. He was 53, and this tower was to be his crowning achievement. As the ceremonies proceeded, 50 engineers were still drafting over 5,300 detailed blueprints for the 132 workmen at the site. It would take four months to lay the foundation for the legs. Two pillars were set on six and a half foot thick concrete slabs set 23 feet below ground. The remaining two legs were positioned so close to the Seine River that watertight metal dams had to be lowered into the damp earth so the concrete could set beneath the seeping water line. The square encompassed by the four legs was 426 feet on each side, broad enough to distribute evenly the structure's 7,000 tons of iron. Onto these foundations arose masonry bases embedded with two anchoring bolts for each of the four feet. From here, the legs would rise at a sharp 60-degree angle as hollow framework beams. The beams were made of angle brackets and flat bars riveted together with stiffeners attached to the sides. Four of these assemblies combined to form the entire beam. The beam had the same structural dynamic as a series of interlocking cubes. And this is the genius of Eiffel's design. The framework support is as sturdy as solid stone at only a fraction of the weight. It was also easily erected with standardized, inexpensive, prefabricated materials. Eventually, 18,000 metal parts and 2,500,000 rivets would comprise the tower. Yet all of the pieces are either flat bars, angle brackets, or plates. The first stage of the construction was also the most critical. All four legs needed to rise simultaneously and meet on an exact horizontal plane at the tower's first floor. The reticle angle demanded scaffolding support for each of the legs and a center scaffold to support the center ring girder which held the structure together. 800-ton thrust jacks operated by manual hydraulic pumps installed under each leg helped to raise and lower the four sides independently in order to reach the required precision. When this was achieved, Gustav Eiffel knew there was nothing that could stop the completion of his dream, although there were those who would try. Eiffel was annoyed by people who lived near the tower who said that it will fall on the houses, and nobody would uh, cover the, the risk. He covered it by himself. Likewise, many people feared that the tower would destroy the Paris skyline. When it was started to be constructed, uh, some people tried to stop it, you see. And uh, some painters, writers, architects wrote a letter saying it's, it's a scandal. The Paris arts community saw the tower as a rude industrial imposition on the city's beauty. Dozens of French writers and painters attacked the tower in a public declaration. I feel Paris is threatened, claimed one artist, by this positively tragic lampstand issuing from her stomach. Eiffel responded with equal passion. The tower will be the highest building ever raised by man, he exclaimed. Will it not have a majesty of its own? By April 1st, 1888, the 300 meter Tower of Paris was an eruption of iron lifting skyward and carrying with it the spirit of France. And finally, the general public, it seemed, was falling in love. 
the people in Paris, general public, uh, really felt a very strong uh, feeling of admiration toward this tower. What had begun as the skeletal suggestion of form was now exhibiting grand flowing design. The graceful rise of the legs, the arcing decorative additions contrasting with the stern regimen of exposed bolts. Here was a work of art that spoke to an aggressive world preparing for dramatic change. The work progressed with lightning speed. Eiffel was mounting the operation as if he were conducting a war with crisp military precision. The structure was in fact prefabricated in the Eiffel uh, factory. While the tower was assembled, at the most you had something like 300 people working on the site. Bits of the structure littered the site like scattered pieces of a child's erector set. Riveting teams worked in groups of four to keep up with the frantic pace. As soon as one load of iron was attached, four 12-ton cranes would deliver more, crawling up the guide shafts where future elevators would soar. The second floor was finished a little over a year after the start of construction. And less than a year after that, on March 31st, 1889, the entire tower was complete. It had taken only two years, two months, and five days to build what would be the world's tallest structure for the next 40 years. Remarkably, there was not a single death as the result of the challenging and dangerous work. Eiffel himself was the first to climb the 1,710 steps to the summit and unfurl the French tricolor flag. Beneath him, the city of Paris. It seemed as if its soul was being funneled up the mighty legs of the tower and sprayed across the sky in a celestial celebration. When the 1889 Universal Exposition of Paris was officially opened, the glittering centerpiece was the 300-meter tower. Officials called it the greatest crowd flabbergasting machine ever built. But soon it was simply to be known as the Eiffel Tower. The tower was called at first the Tower of 320 Meters. Even in the beginning, the pylon of 320 meters. Then the 320 meter tower. I don't know exactly when it became the Tower of Mr. Eiffel and later the Eiffel Tower. I think it escaped him that it would go any further than a very high functional tower of great dimension. The Eiffel Tower is rooted in both the majestic and the mundane. It may have been the tallest structure on the planet, but it was equally cherished by Monsieur Eiffel because of the tremendous personal income it generated. You know, Mr. Eiffel practically funded the construction of the tower. In fact, he paid for most of it, and he made a deal. He said, if you give me the right to work on it for 20 years, I'll agree to finance at 80%. If he had not believed in the success of his tower, he would not have jumped into this venture in which he succeeded so magnificently. Monsieur Eiffel had a private apartment on the tower from which he conducted scientific experiments and met with important dignitaries. All the while, he could watch the elevators lifting nearly two million tourists to the top in the first year representing over one million dollars income to Eiffel as he personally garnered the receipts from ticket sales. Eiffel could uh, earn money with the people going up and he made a great lot of money. He was very rich after. Eiffel was well, not at all an artist. He was an entrepreneur. Contrasting opinions of Monsieur Eiffel spring from the multifaceted and conflicting nature of his character. He may not have been an artist, but his approach to metal frame construction established a structural aesthetic which is still admired today. He may have been a national hero after building the tower in 1889, but the next year, he was convicted of profiteering in the failed French effort to construct a Panama Canal. 
The canal was the dream of French engineer Ferdinand de Lesseps, who had triumphed with his Suez Canal and was determined to duplicate that feat in Panama. De Lesseps invited Eiffel to suggest an engineering approach to accomplish the jungle waterway, and Eiffel proposed an innovative system of locks. That idea was rejected by de Lesseps, and the result was disastrous. Canals cannot be carved through swamps and jungle. The attempt proved so expensive and unproductive, the French government was nearly thrown into bankruptcy. The political fallout was severe. Anyone even remotely associated with the failed attempt was vilified, and Eiffel was sentenced to 24 months in prison. That judgment was later overturned, but by then Eiffel had lost his appetite for the construction business. Eiffel was considered by, uh, by all engineers like, like a god, you see. And he was very, uh, he, was, he was also a man of science, he loved science. And when, after the Tao, he, he stopped uh, building things. Instead, Eiffel, now 73, dedicated himself to pure scientific study, specifically the exploration of aerodynamics. Other French visionaries, like author Jules Verne, had applied crude 19th century notions to the concept of flight, as illustrated in this early film proposing a trip to the moon. Eiffel realized that advancements in aviation would need to be based on the scientific study of the natural elements. But while some well-meaning researchers were mired in the idea of outlandish mechanical contraptions, and others were attaching feathered wings to their arms and tossing themselves off the tower like birds, Eiffel returned to his analytical roots and built a workshop that still operates today. Monsieur Eiffel? Mr. Eiffel, well, he made the first wind resistance tests because all of his life he had problems with the wind. That was his enemy, number one. And in 1906 to 1909, he began to question aerodynamic resistance, and that's why he made this first wind tunnel. One can say that in this wind tunnel, where you're standing right now, French aviationary studies began. I must specify that the tunnel, the ventilator, the motor, and all of these are originals. We don't touch them. We leave them in their original state. As for measuring devices, of course, we adapted them for modern functions. Mr. Eiffel was an extraordinary engineer. We've examined all he did during his lifetime and all that he envisioned. And today, we are doing things that Mr. Eiffel already did in 1917. Eiffel's biggest vision, the 300-meter tower, was only supposed to stand for 20 years. But he had grown accustomed to using the structure as his personal reception area, a way to maintain his high profile over Parisian society. So he launched an aggressive campaign to save his tower from the wrecking ball. He conducted over 5,000 experiments in his lofty laboratory, but it was radio that saved the day and the tower. The giant metal structure was the perfect antenna. From the top, signals could be transmitted as far away as North America. So although destined for demolition in 1909, Eiffel's tower won a reprieve as radio helped France monitor the dark clouds of war looming over Germany. In 1914, world war swept over the European continent. For Paris, the conflict came so close that soldiers often took taxis to travel to the front lines. But with the help of the Eiffel Tower, Generals could listen in on the movements of the enemy and declare Zeppelin alerts from their elevated perch. In 1923, five years after the last echoes of the war, Gustave Eiffel died. Throughout his 91 years, his vision propelled France to the forefront of emerging technologies. His interpretation of design and structure as represented by his tower was the world's introduction to basic 20th century principles. 
the future of construction would forevermore be linked to the unified participation of modest interlocking elements. It was a concept whose time had come. After the devastation of World War, Paris was anxious to lift its battered spirits and embrace a brighter day. Yet some sensed a subtle, desperate undercurrent to the celebratory esprit. It was as if the frantic good times were masking the many issues the war had left unsettled. Paris in the 20s attracted a lost generation disillusioned with traditional values and philosophies. Some of these post-war Parisians were actually American artists and intellectuals, searching for meaning in a seemingly chaotic world. F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife Zelda, Charlie Chaplin, movie stars, painters, and a mixed assortment of creative individuals became attracted to a French revolution in thinking called existentialism is what we are the sum of our existence our time and poetry nothing more than absurdist fantasy darker themes of alienation started to emerge in the arts and ironically the tower provided a visual and symbolic link to a lighter and more stable time after all Gustave Eiffel had created weightless beauty from dense heavy metal a very reassuring concept. The Eiffel Tower is not only the iron composing it, but also what's inside, air, captured in a latticework of metal. Some visitors feel that they are in the middle of nowhere. The sensation suggests that it's not only the structure, but also its void, which is the essential material of the Eiffel Tower. The tower's bold composition seemed a poetic link between the 19th and 20th centuries. A link which would be brutally severed when fascism, racism, and systematic murder erupted from the ashes of Germany's defeat in the First World War. May 1940, in the terrifying panic of a Nazi blitzkrieg, Paris and the Eiffel Tower were taken hostage. But German troops found it difficult fully to utilize the monument. Frenchmen had damaged the elevators. This sabotage kept even Hitler from savoring his conquest. There's a very uh, famous photo He's on the Trocadero, he looks at the tower, but he hasn't been on it. There were no lifts, so couldn't go. Seeing the tower occupied by Nazis enraged French citizens. Parisians joined together in futile counterattacks. The free French secretly conspired in the ancient Roman catacombs, which weave beneath the streets of Paris. Tunnels hiding the bones of forgotten and vanquished Frenchmen throughout the centuries were now home to the resistance. There are subterranean passages that go underneath the French capital. The catacombs played an important role in the resistance. It was a means for us to travel across Paris without being seen in order to be able to lead the Parisian insurrection on the offense. We derailed trains because those trains that went to the front lines of the Atlantic all went behind Paris. I participated in the sabotage of railroad tracks, tracks that were obviously meant for trains that transported soldiers. But one day, we found out about a large train that circled Paris. We made arrangements, we derailed the train, and it was just awful because the train was packed with sauerkraut. There were particles of sauerkraut for miles around. 
Hitler despised the free French and planned to destroy their most treasured monument out of spite. At the war's end, Hitler gave orders to have the tower bombed. But General von Cholitz, who had fallen in love with the city of Paris, gave the Eiffel Tower an unauthorized reprieve. People of Western Europe, a landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. The hour of your liberation is approaching. American tanks finally drove the Nazis from the Eiffel Tower. But when liberation finally came to Paris, the French government was in a shambles. The old leaders were gone. The next generation was ill-equipped to raise the country to its former glory. From 1945 through 1960, the people of France voted 20 different provisional governments into power. It was political chaos. Until General Charles de Gaulle was finally persuaded to lead the country out of post-war calamity. Only a man of his strength and broad appeal could have saved the Republic. De Gaulle rallied the disheartened country and gave France back its spirit. Its soul, however, had always been protected in that giant cage of the Eiffel Tower. But just as France needed a new vision for the second half of the 20th century, the Eiffel Tower needed a new commitment to its care and maintenance, if it were to stand at all. It was designed as the centerpiece of an international exposition in 1889. Today, more than a century later, the celebration continues, as well over a thousand people visit the Eiffel Tower every hour. There are four elevators to carry them to the top, one in each of the tower legs, rising at a steep 60-degree angle. The heart of the hoisting is actually hidden beneath the legs in a century-old catacomb. Here, complex contraptions rival Jules Verne's most elaborate fantasies. The original principle was to have water under pressure, pushing a piston, there was pushing a dolly, the dolly was pulling the cable to heave the car up. The 100-year-old technology forms an animated mosaic, giving the impression that the lifting is done by a giant mechanical toy. This piston rings, which are inside here, they have square cotton wreath about that big, which we press in, and they're greased with mutton fat. See it? See it? Very wide, very nice one. Twice a week here, it smells like having a mishui, you know, this uh, North African uh, roasted lamb. That's it. All technology works beautifully. That's, that's uh, leather. That's leather, same material. But it's compressed, it's shaped, with various shapes. It's true leather, and it's impregnated with oil, which is made from the hooves of oxen. In 1980, officials decided to upgrade the system by blending the old technology with the latest high-tech equipment. It's like mixing the engine of a Ferrari and the engine of a, of a Mack truck. At the third level, a second bank of elevators carries passengers vertically to the summit. Atop the structure, maintenance is non-stop. Every day, a small but determined team of 25 workers walk the narrow iron supports for the 18-month job of painting the tower. 
The process is the same today as when the tower was originally painted. Over 50 tons of paint is required to complete the task, a task that is repeated every seven years. I was 18 years old when I began this job in the air as an industrial painter. To work on the Eiffel Tower, such an important monument, I feel privileged and happy. But being a painter is somewhat specialized. You have to be physically strong and have a good morale. It's dangerous. One requires strength and balance, of course. The higher I am, the better I feel. But painters aren't alone on the elevated web of iron. Electricians also comb the tower. Personally, I'd much rather work up here than in an office. I think my friend agrees. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we get to be outdoors. We like what we do. To be able to work on a monument like uh, the Eiffel Tower is a privilege, I'd say. The exposed nature of the structure occasionally allows the elements to inflict damage. Water pipes can freeze and burst if not protected by the electrical system. There are heating bands with thermostats. As soon as the temperature falls below 40 degrees, the heating bands kick in. The piping is heated. But the main job of the electricians is to maintain the illuminated beauty. 360 light bulbs are constantly inspected and changed. But climbing to the sockets often upsets the real residents of the tower, the birds. They're attracted by the light. Once they come close, they get a bit lost. When they try to sit out again, they get caught in the steelwork. But a lot of them manage to fly off unharmed. We've actually even seen birds come and make their nests in the steel beams. It's kind of nice because in Paris, we're not used to seeing pigeons anymore. It's a pleasant change. Early evening, the sun casts its last golden pink rays over the city of Paris. The homes, the museums, the monuments and cathedrals, and the couples who gather on the tower. The tower responds as if its own glorious wash of color is the reflected glow of lovers. The lighting design is calculated to enhance the romantic ambiance. Dans la peinture. The paint on the Eiffel Tower contains a yellow pigment. Lighting it with yellow light brings out the yellow pigment. That's been the major source of success in this operation. The approach is entirely different because night lighting must interpret the feeling, even the expression of the monument. The Eiffel Tower lighting seeks to validate the architecture of this star attraction in Paris. It's the star of Paris at night. People who work at the tower are uh, very proud. Some even but too proud. <laughs> it's like if they had built the tower. There is a sense of ownership which is shared among those who work the tower, especially the employees whose task is to greet visitors. My job is. My job, in fact, is to organize the tour guides. I am responsible for the group. We're now in the North Pillar. Each of the four corners of the Eiffel Tower is represented by pillars in which you will find the elevators. Down there is the beautiful France restaurant and above it the Parisian restaurant, the two restaurants of the first level. And over there is the Cinemax gallery where you'll find a post office, souvenir shops, buffets, ice cream vendors. There are lots of interesting things in the gallery. The tower was originally designed as a tourist mecca, 
and it still serves that light-hearted function today. But its magnificent vistas and staggering height sometimes attract a darker element. People periodically try to jump off the Eiffel Tower. Already 380 people have committed suicide. That's an average of about three or four a year. So we regularly try to control the situation. We try to reason with them. We would try to find out their motive. We discuss it with them. We try to talk with them as much as possible until security comes. And from then on, it's the fireman's responsibility. More often, a tour guide has the opportunity to see people in a more festive and romantic mood. I have seen a lot of couples walking arm in arm. They often come to celebrate an event or an anniversary. Our job also includes discouraging these people from riding on the Eiffel Tower. Most of the time we chase them and we try to catch them, and sometimes it's a little game between the tourists and ourselves. We are on the third floor of the Eiffel Tower in front of the Jules Verne restaurant. This restaurant is one of the symbols of Paris precisely because it's located way up on the third floor. There's only one Eiffel Tower, only one third floor. It's certainly the best location in the world unless there's a restaurant on top of Mount Everest. The ceremony and celebration of haute cuisine is a tradition on the tower extending back to its earliest days. Food is more than nourishment for the French, it is a passion. It happened about six months after I arrived in Paris. I informed my wife that I had a mistress. She just stared at me. And I said, she's an old mistress. She looked even more surprised. After about five minutes, I told her my mistress is the Eiffel Tower. Some artists paint, some work in stone. Master chef Alain Rex prefers pâté, practicing his culinary magic at the Jules Verne, the exclusive four-star restaurant midway up the lofty height of the tower. The view of Paris really inspires me. It inspires me to create new dishes every day. We have 115 people employed in the Jules Verne restaurant alone. There's a lot of hustle and bustle, a lot of people. I love that. Armed with spatulas, whisks, paring knives, and souffle dishes, Chef Rex and his men fight for the honor of France. Today is special, a lobster salad and coral sauce. It's French lobster. The tower was designed to inspire the common person to new visions. It also encourages the imaginations of artists to soar. At the Jules Verne restaurant, these two dynamics take flight. It is an appetizing blend that could only happen in the city of light. Paris is often called the city of light. But to what quality of light does the title refer? Does it suggest the lightness of the French spirit? The enlightenment of the French culture? Or perhaps the brilliant light of the French sky? Bleaching marble facades by day and by night, cradling lovers in its rose-colored evening mist. Maybe it's the magic light of a cabaret where Toulouse-Lautrec painted and played. Or the glittering sparkle of a merry-go-round reflected in the eyes of the young at heart. The light of Paris is all these images and experiences, yet it finds its most vibrant voice in the silent exultation of Monsieur Eiffel's tower.
I believe that the Eiffel Tower has taken an entirely unique place in the world. It's almost become a myth. It sort of glorifies science. It was built during an era when it was thought that science and technology would make mankind happy. I believe also, because of its shape, it is very, very special and can be easily drawn. I think also that it is a useless object and that a useless object has a great therapeutic value. So the Eiffel Tower stands as a monument to those things we cannot grasp, our joys, our hopes. It still stands as a technological marvel, but in its simple, elegant, uplifting form, we find a way to celebrate life and love. <laughs>